276. Another mom, noon, we haven't done here, or we haven't done it since I've been here anyway. Noon, which is a few years now. And we're just kind of expanding our horizons a little bit with these new hymnals that we have. Yep. And learn some new songs. Mm -hmm. so page 276. Prayer bells of heaven.
carries dot one force. I think that thing's dead. <laughs> Tell you what, Ms. Mark. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Lord. Uh, I'm going to be singing off of a CD that I figured the phone The Lord been giving me songs for the last over 50 years. I've written about 300, 200, 160 of them. So recorded some of them. This one I'm going to sing off of the recording I made last year uh, in Tulsa. It's entitled, Where Would I Be? Just because you wrote it, don't mean you memorized it. Huh?
every time my thoughts return to Calvary and the sacrifice that they be made for me. Jody and I do, and 48 years of marriage. So uh, I know some of you were telling me, I said 62. I said, well, you got me beat by a little bit there. But uh, it's so good to be with you, and, and uh, I appreciate Brother Billy so much. And some of you I may have met somewhere at some other time because I've preached all over Nassau County, Southeast Georgia, Jacksonville, as director when I was the director of Northeast Florida Baptist Association. And got acquainted with Brother Billy at least 21 years ago at, at least, Spring yeah. Hill. Yeah. And I uh, appreciate him, appreciate him sticking with the stuff. And, um, man, you, you pastored for four years. Yes. And I'm proud of you for that. <laughs> and, uh, and then your pastor now, Paul, Brother Paul, called me the other day. And, uh, he, I appreciate him so much. He called to ask how my son was doing. I have a son who is 42. I think Stephen is 42. Anyway, uh, he got acquainted with Brother Paul when he lived in Uly, and, and it's a long story. I can't get into that, but Stephen has had a lot of struggles, and uh, one of the few people that I know called and said, just want to know how your son's doing. And I said, well, I appreciate that so much, and he told me that he was pastoring here now, and uh, one thing led to another, and that's how this invitation to come fill in for him worked out. But uh, I remember several years ago, he felt God's call on his life. He he gave me a call, said my my brother John Casper says you need to call David Gray, and uh, he said to me then, God's leading me into evangelism to do evangelism. And I said, buddy, uh, that's going to be tough because we're living in a time, this was before COVID, but even before COVID hit, uh, churches had quit doing revival meetings. Yeah. And I interpreted it. I mean, there's a lot of ways, and I'm going to talk to you about a lot of ways to do evangelism today, but mainly when preachers call you and say God's leading me into full-time evangelism, uh, they're looking to book meetings and preach revivals. And I said, uh, that's a, a tough road to hold today because churches just aren't having it. Now they're coming back, 
I was telling Brother Billy I preached a revival in Lake City and Dade City uh, recently, and, and the church in Dade City said, hey, we it was last October, they said, will you come back again this October? So I'm headed back down south to Dade City to do a meeting down there, so churches are getting back into it. Yeah. But little old brother Paul says, I'm pastoring a church. And, and I guess the, the, the commendation I have for him is he persevered. He stuck with his calling. And um, I recommended him a few places. I think he went down to Grover Road and uh, preached down there, Grover Road Baptist. And anyway, I'm glad that he ended up here with you all. Amen. And uh, he, he's a, a, a great man of God, and I know God is going to use him in a mighty way. So uh, if, if he looks at this on Facebook, thank you, Pastor Paul, for inviting me, and uh, we love you very, very much. I hope you've got your Bibles. I want you to open with me to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, and I'm going to look at a couple of verses, and uh, I hope you listen real quick. Uh, put your fast listener on, and uh, because there's a lot can be said about the one verse that I'm going to focus in on today, but uh, I'm going to speak kind of about what my brother saying about uh, about the cross, uh, the preaching of the cross. What is the message of the cross? And uh, we're living in a day and time. Uh, people don't like the cross. In fact, I uh, I, I read a. I call it a tweet. I don't. What are we calling it now that Elon Musk has changed it to X? X, I guess. <laughs> okay. Yeah. He Xed. A, you know, I don't. I still call it a tweet. <laughs> but he had this yesterday or the day before, and I was thinking of this text, so I printed it out. He said, after 50 years, the city council of Albany, California, had a 28-foot tall hilltop cross taken down because they did not like what it stood for. Mm. Wow. The cross had been maintained by the local Lions Club for decades. Christians who live there want to bring it back, and I hope they can. And then he quotes uh, one of the verses I'm going to use today. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Amen. Verse 1 right. 118. Uh, and I was mentioning that my wife and I were talking about it coming over today. And, and uh, she said, well, what's the big deal about a cross? And I said, well, just like in, in this chapter we're going to read today, uh, in verse 22 it says, The Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews. It's a stumbling block. Yeah. And unto the Greeks, the Gentiles, it's foolishness. That's right. But we know to those of us that are saved, it's the very power of God. Amen. So let's look together in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And uh, I want to read verse 17 and 18. And if you're able to, would you stand in reverence to God's word? That's my custom. I ask people to stand. If you're not able to, that's fine. Just follow along with me. But follow along silently as I read our text aloud. Paul says, in the midst of... As he introduces here in Corinthians, the struggle, one of the problems Corinth had was there was division all over the place. Mm -hmm. But he says in verse 17, uh, and he's, he says, there's some of you that are following me. And, and, you know, he mentions, he says, everybody is following this one. There's Apollos and Paul or Peter, and some of you are, are following me. But he said, for Christ, in verse 17, sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel. That kind of blows baptismal regeneration out of the water, doesn't it? <laughs> there are still folks that think you've got to be baptized to be saved, but salvation is in grace alone, through Christ alone, Amen. through faith alone. That's right. For Christ sent me not to preach, uh, for, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom words, lest the cross of Christ would be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the very power of God. Amen. Pray with me once more. Father, I pray that you will enlighten me today. 
illuminate my mind, loosen my tongue, anoint me, and permit me to preach. For Lord, if you don't do the preaching through me, there will be no preaching take place. So God, we just commit it into your hands this time. Your word never returns void. Someone here today has a need of hearing something I've got to say from this Amen. scripture. Not what I have to say, but what you have to say in your word. Lord, Amen. just bless the word. If there's any here that don't know Jesus and the free pardon of sin, may today be the day of salvation for that one. May they say yes to Jesus who said yes to the cross for them. And God, for those of us that know you, stir our hearts anew and afresh to the things of God, and we shall be careful to give you glory. In Jesus' name I pray and for his sake. Amen. 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 God bless you. You may be seated. The message of the cross. Um, we're going to look at several things in one verse. I want to talk to you about the preaching of the cross. And there needs to be the preaching of the cross. Then we're going to talk about why we preach the cross. Because there's the perishing of the lost. People that don't know Jesus are really perishing. And then there is the perplexity of the wise. The, the vast majority of the wisdom of this world, and in our world just filled with worldly wisdom. Man, look at the culture we're in. Look at the situation we're in as a country. Yep. And uh, they look at the cross and, and you know, they're perplexed because it's just foolishness to them. Mm -hmm. And then there is the perception of the saved. We know that the, the cross, the preaching of the cross is the power of God. And uh, then we're going to conclude with the power of God. But the preaching of the cross, Paul said in verse 18, for the preaching. Now, you may, I preach out of the King James because I'm not a King James only guy, but that's what I memorize scripture in. That's what I, I just have it committed to memory. Yeah. Uh, so the preaching of the cross. Now, if you do a word study, the word preaching there in some translations, and it's not wrong. Uh, it may say the message of the cross. And really a preaching ought to bring forth the message, right? Right. And then sometimes it'll say in other translations the word of the cross. But whatever it is, the word of the cross and Jesus going to the cross and shedding his blood and dying on that old ringy cross amazingly to the world is offensive. But it's the, it's the only message that can save souls. Mm -hmm. So we need to be focusing, and when I say we, I'm not just talking about preachers. I'm talking about all of us. Every single one of us in here today are full-time Christian servants. Right. And we're to be about preaching. Now you may say, well, now wait a minute. I'm just not gifted to get behind the pulpit and preach. Well, I realize that. There's a certain calling for that. But everyone, and I think this is a fallacy we've got in our head. Well, you know, the preacher's to be the one that does the evangelism. The preacher's to be the one that goes and leads people to Jesus. But the fact of the matter is, Paul said to Timothy that we all need to do the work of an evangelist. Right. Evangelist is a gift. I always prayed that I could be an evangelist, and God didn't gift me that way. We talk about old Rick Corum. Yeah. I know Tim Williams, and I've known great evangelist J. Harold Smith. And uh, Dr. Homer Lindsay Jr., last time I heard Homer Lindsay Jr. preach, he gave his testimony and 30 people got saved. And I said, you know, that guy could get up and re recite Mary Had a Little Lamb and somebody would get saved. Yeah. He's just got the gift Amen. of evangelism. <laughs> well, even though I don't have that gift, I'm to do the work of an evangelist, which means I share the gospel whenever the opportunity arises. And there are several ways of sharing the gospel. First of all, we'll deal with the obvious, and that's public preaching. I'm preaching publicly. I'm sharing the gospel today. So there's public preaching. Then secondly, there's personal testimony. And uh, for a couple of years, I taught personal evangelism for Moody Bible Institute in their evening school. They came to me when I pastored down in West Pasco County, around Newport Ritchie, and they said, we'd like you to teach. And I said, well, uh, I'm fine if you will let me select the subject. 
They said, well, what do you want to teach? I said, well, one thing I'd like to teach is personal evangelism. The other class I taught for Moody was the Christian confronting the cults. So they let me pick it out, and that was just down my alley. But uh, one thing I taught the class, and I started telling the churches that I pastor, if you've never sat down and written your testimony out, you need to do so. Yeah. Do you have, can you, and I, you know, when I was teaching in the class, I used to say, you need to be able to share your testimony in about a minute and a half. I don't know today if people will even give you a minute and a half. Maybe <laughs> you've got to scale that down to a minute. You say, well, what do, I, what do I focus on in my personal testimony? Well, when Paul in the book of Acts gave his testimony about how he got saved, he talked about, this is what I was before I got saved. Number one, this is how I got saved and came to Jesus. Number two, and number three, this is how I have been since I came to know Jesus. So in our introductory class at Moody, when I taught at Moody, my first go-around there, I had probably 25 or 30 students, and they were, and this was for college, you could actually earn your degree through Moody, even though it was down in Florida, in West Pasco County, and I... I told the class, I said, we're going to write our testimonies out. And I went into it a little more explaining in detail than I am with you. But I got them writing. I said, just take a pen and pencil and you write in your own handwriting and share your testimony. There was a young lady probably from here to my wife from me. And she just was looking kind of blank, <laughs> looking down. Now, these are church folks coming to Moody to get college credit for a class of personal evangelism. And I went back to her and I said, are you having trouble with the assignment? And she said, yeah, I, I sure am. I've been a church member for several years, but I realize when you're talking about writing my testimony out, I don't have a testimony. Well, we got... It went from being an academic setting there to be an evangelistic setting. Yeah. And I said, well, let's forget about church membership. Let's forget about however long you've been attending church or what church you belong to. Let's settle this right now. Long story short, she prayed verbally and invited Christ into her life. And I said, now you write your testimony just as how it has happened. And uh, after they all got through, I went back to her and I said, by the way, you're going to read your testimony at the first part of the class next week. But she like fell out. <laughs> I said, no, people need to hear this. They need to hear that you've been a church member for X amount of time, but you never came to know Jesus till tonight when I sat you down and asked you to write your testimony out. So I started doing that with my whole church as I, as I pastored churches. And, uh, you know, you need personal testimony. Do you have a personal testimony? All of us have a testimony. When you got up today and you put your Bible under your arm and you walked out in your car and you pulled out of your driveway, that in itself is a testimony that you're saying, I believe in God's word and I'm headed out to church Amen. to worship the Lord. Maybe God's going to lead you to engage that neighbor. That brings me to the third thing about how we preach. There's public preaching. There's personal testimony. But then there is in the scripture one-on-one -on -one sharing of the gospel. And uh, there needs that needs to take place. Where we sit down with a neighbor or a friend or a loved one and, and ask them, do you know for certain you have eternal life and you're going to go to heaven when you die? And share with them that God loves them and Jesus died for them. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see, that's the preaching of the cross. Well, there's a whole lot more I could say about that. But the reason we preach, I want to go to the second point, is that there's the perishing of the lost. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish. I'm afraid, down through the years, and I've been doing this, I went to my first church. I was 20 years old in 1975. I didn't know which end was up. Clay Sink Baptist Church. Look it up. 
on the internet and there it, it's a historical place and there's a lot I, I can't get into it a lot to be said about placing Baptist Church but back then in those days we realized that anybody without Jesus was lost and uh, I don't know where this ideology has come from uh, you know I heard before Billy Graham passed away or maybe I heard it from Franklin he said that only about 25% of church attenders believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven oh. and we're, we're not winning that battle yeah. and it was amazing too that they asked the question do you believe that Jesus was born of a virgin very few church members believe that hmm. do you believe the Bible is literally true very few church members believe that. I learned a long time ago, if you can get the first 11 chapters of Genesis down and the major events that there was the fall, the flood, the Tower of Babel, and uh, if you can get those first 11 chapters down that they happened just the way God says they did, it did, you won't have any problem with the rest of the Bible. All of this stuff of gender confusion and all this mess. Yeah. You know, I've been a I've been a, a boy and a man for sixty eight years, and I never wondered was I a girl. <laughs> and I had a background in athletics, and uh, played football for a number of years till I was twenty one years of age. I never dreamed of wanting to get on a football field and knock a woman down. That wouldn't be something that I'd brag about. Yeah. Okay. Now, now we, we had some tough things that, you know, somebody would get knocked down and one of my teammates would say, hey, you're a real woman or something like that. But that was an insult. And uh, I don't know how I got off on that. Let me get back off track. We're just in a mess as a country, aren't we? Yeah, we are. But there is the perishing of the lost. And what I want you to see is, you know, somewhere we got away from the point that Jesus is the only way. And uh, he's the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes unto the Father but by him. Right. And when we think of perishing, John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. What does perish mean? Perish means to die spiritually, to be cast from the presence of God, and to live in hell eternally. Yeah. And that's where people without Jesus are headed. And does it bother us that we have neighbors or family or friends that do not know Jesus? You see, it ought to. We ought to have a prayer list. When I pastored, I used to teach my folks, you ought to be praying for at least five lost people and praying that God will give you an opportunity to share. And uh, I was kind of rough as a pastor. Uh, people would come to me and say, hey, you need to go talk to so-and-so and see if they're saved. I said, well, you go talk to them first, and then come tell me what they say. Yeah. And then I'll go talk to them. Now, I didn't, sometimes I didn't adhere to that as a strict rule because I knew that there were some people that just were uncomfortable about sharing for whatever reason. And I had to accept that even though I was a... a in my heart, I was an evangelist. I just had to accept that. But you see, there's the preaching of the cross. Because there's the perishing of the lost, people that die without Jesus are lost. And then I want to talk to you about the perplexity of the wise. Notice it says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Yep. Verse 27 in our text says, but God had chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, and he had chosen the weak things of this world and things which are mighty, and found the things which are mighty, and base things 
of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Man, I tell you, when you think of the wisdom of man, and, and God does choose the weak and the base things of this world. I, I've known a lot of real popular preachers. Now, like Junior Hill says, there are some preachers that can strut sitting down. But I, I've known some. I, you know, we just lost Charles Stanley. But we didn't lose him. We know where he is. But I met Dr. Stanley years ago. And uh, he was so humble. And he talked to me just like I was the only guy in the room, wanted to know where I served, where I <coughs> ministered. He was humble. He was real. And, uh, I mean, he was just as down to earth as could be. And if you talk to him, if you listen to his testimony on tapes, he really never, he really never dreamed he would go where he did. Uh, in fact, the one time he was down in Bartow, Florida. He'd been down there less than a year, and God moved him as associate pastor to First of Atlanta. He didn't want to be pastor. But God placed him. And I'm not saying that at, at any time. To me, I didn't think him as a base person. I thought him as a brilliant man. But God says he chose base things of this world so that he could confound the wisdom of the world. Yeah. And, you know, I uh, I surrendered to the ministry at 20, age 20. I was studying in a state school. I was studying to be a physical education major, and I was going to coach football and uh, teach physical education. I had it all figured out. And God intervened and messed everything up. <laughs> and, uh, we felt the call. Jody was attending the University of South Florida. I was attending St. Petersburg College. And uh, we began to feel God's calling us to ministry. Now, when I, I write my personal memoirs. I probably never publish them. I've got them for my kids, so when I die, they can read about it. But I call it, if you don't think God has a sense of humor, go look in the mirror. <laughs> And I was the least unlikely person for God to call to ministry. Well, we said yes to his calling, and three months later, we got a ex call extended from Clay St. Baptist Church. I knew how to coach football. I knew a whole lot about physical education, but I didn't know anything about preaching. I didn't know anything about pastoring a church. But God began to develop me, and God began to teach me, and you see, that's the perplexity of the wise. It, it says here that the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto them which are saved it is the power of God. The world looks at churches and preaching and says that's foolish. But you know what? When you look at the world, I've come to have a, a new meaning of this verse in Romans 1.22. Professing themselves to be wise... They have become fools. Amen. Yeah, right. And frankly, we've got fools all over this country. Yeah. I don't want to get political. I'll let you evaluate our leaders based on what the Word of God says. Hmm. But professing ourselves to be wise, themselves to be wise, they've become fools. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there's the perception of the saved in verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. I, I like, uh, it says, are saved. But when you do the breakdown of the verse there, it's talking about being saved. In other words, I have been saved, I am being saved, and I'm going to be saved. Both past, present, and future. Amen. God's got me sheltered in his hands. Amen. which are being saved. And uh, that leads me to the fifth point. And again, you're not listening fast enough, so I'm moving <laughs> on. 
But I want to touch on this. There's the power of God. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved, it is the power of God. Listen mm -hmm. to what Paul yeah. says in Romans chapter 1, verse 14. I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, to the wise and the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I want you to catch the power of God. It's mentioned also here in verse 18, and it's the same Greek word there for power. It's the word dunamis. Mm -hmm. And we get the word transliterated into English, dynamite. Now, there's dynamic power in the gospel. Amen. There's dynamic power in the word. Amen. There's dynamic power in dynamite, amen? Yeah. If I pull the stick out from under here and lift the fuse, you'd be hitting the door, amen? <laughs> because you know if I tossed it out in amongst us, the power that's there in dynamite. You see, the gospel is the dynamite. It's not me. It's not me winning somebody over. It is the simplicity of the gospel that breaks the hard heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've seen a lot of hard hearts. Man, I could go on for 30 minutes and tell you about hard hearts that God has broken. I'll just give you one. Uh, my, my dad was one of the most precious guys I ever knew. Now, he was hard. Mm -hmm. He was tough. Uh... And I would share the gospel with him. He came to hear me one time preach, and he sat there and wept. And um, I, in fact, I avoided everybody following him out the door, and I said, what's wrong? And he said, I can't talk about it. And he would never talk about it with me. I tried to say, Dad, what's wrong? And uh, I was doing a meeting, a January Bible study down in Hudson, Florida. And he lived down there. And the Lord said, going down the road, go by and invite him church and I said Lord he don't want anything to do with church you ever argue with God Yeah. God he don't want anything to do with you he don't want anything to do with church he and I had even had some conflict head buddy about his lifestyle not that it was immoral or anything but you know he thought God's last name was down you know what I'm talking yeah. about mm -hmm. I said daddy I, I, that bothers me it grieves me and he'd always say, if you don't like it, get in your car and go home. Well, I get in my car and go home. Now, we always maintained our relationship. Long story short, I invited him, got a grunt out of him and uh, about coming to church, Hicks Road Baptist Church, and I was preaching a January Bible study back then when we did those, Brother Billy, on Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you had been quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And uh, after a couple of stanzas of the first verse, I looked, and in the back, and the building was about this size, except they didn't have nice seats. They just had old <laughs> plank pews, wooden pews nailed together. But he came in, sat on the back row. And when the invitation was given, he responded. And I went on, I Praise that Ephesians 2, by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves, not of works, lest any should boast. And Dad came and gave his life to Jesus. Mm -hmm. I, it tore me up so much. My pastor, Brother Buddy Mathis, I turned to him, and uh, I said, look, you got to talk to him. I'm afraid I'm going to mess it up, so you talk to him. So one of the hardest guys and hard-hearted guys I ever knew, but all of my arguing with him and telling him I didn't like the way he cussed or telling him he ought to come to church with me didn't do any good. But hearing the gospel did. The gospel is the power of God and salvation. Amen. Amen. Another thing I used to teach in personal evangelism, you know, when you do go into a house and you begin to share, somebody's going to come up with a goofy question. Well, I want to know where Cain got his wife. I said, well, you just get back to the gospel. Tell them, 
You don't know where he did that, but if, if she suited Cain, she suits me. Let's get back to the fact that God loves you. Jesus died for you. Mm -hmm. Stick to the gospel right. because it is the power of God into salvation. Well, the preaching of the cross, the message of the cross, carry the message of the cross with you wherever you go. Through Callahan, through Nassau County, tell people that God loves them and Jesus died for them. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Well, let's bow our heads, close our eyes. I want to conclude with a time of invitation. And I'm going to have, ask Brother Billy to come and stand in the front. And of course, I'll be here to talk with you, but he's been your pastor. And he's 